Welcome to our guest speaker Etsy Up panel discussion. My name is Jessica Baldi, and I head up brand partnerships at Etsy, and I will be your moderator. Um, today we'll be hearing from this all-star panel of entrepreneurs about their experiences in marketing, how they stand out in the industry, what works for them, what hasn't worked in the past, and all the learnings from those experiences to get to where they are now. And with that, I'm happy to introduce our panelists. We have Maxwell Ryan, a pioneer in the blogosphere and now CEO and founder of Apartment Therapy Media, including the wildly popular blog Apartment Therapy. Kurt Stevens, who after being in the packaging business for 30 years, devoted what he learned to launch the venture Box Up, an online platform that empowers unconventional customers with their ability to custom design their own packaging. We have Cassie Bourne, the woman behind the company Men Maker Mentors, who also left her full-time job to pursue her passion empowering creatives with knowledge on how to leverage influential bloggers and social media to build communities around their work. Eric Cass, who after years of branding for small startups to Fortune 500 companies and everything in between, founded his own company, Funnel. And then we have Melissa Romig, over 17 years of experience in digital marketing and advertising, now focusing on strategic customer mm -hmm. acquisition methods at our favorite online print company, Moo. Cool. So um, I'm very excited to be here to talk with you all. Um, we have three main areas that we're going to cover. Um, one, brand building. Two, marketing distribution. And three, continuous development and evolution of brand and marketing strategy tactics. All right, so to start, as um, you've made your leap into running your own business, what did you find was the most significant marketing tactic in the early days to launching your business? Okay, I, I guess yeah. I will start. So um, when I launched Maker Mentors, the way that we did it is that we partnered with online influencers and people who already had an audience and were creating content online and um, we worked with them in a way that helped them have more content, helped them monetize their audience. And because we did that, we didn't have to spend money on marketing, which I know is a huge obstacle for people when they're first starting out, that you don't have a lot of money to invest in your marketing. And so working with influencers and creating partnerships like that are a really cost-effective way to kind of build your initial audience and kind of get that foundation there. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just jump in and say, uh, apartment therapy is a little different because we're not obviously, we don't sell anything, but we still rely on, we need to reach readers, and readers, in a sense, the more readers we have, we sell advertising, so that's our, that we do need, we do have to market ourselves to a certain extent. I would say in, in the early days, though, um, we didn't have to, obviously, didn't call it marketing, but you have to do just a very, very good job of staying close to your, to your customer because I think any new business uh, the, the, the initial pop that you get is word of mouth. And it is, it is one of the most amazing things you can have in the life cycle of business, and you don't ever get it quite again. Um, but when you are brand new and people fall in love with you, they will talk about you. Um, but So you can learn a lot from them by that conversation that they have, but you can also be a part of that conversation. So I would say if you're really at the very beginning, um, the, the time that you spend staying close to your customers, literally... E emailing them unasked of, uh, if they ask a question or if they send in you an email to their, you know, to your info dot or whatever, at whatever, and you write back personally, if you're just on it, so that you have a personal connection to your first, the first people who are finding you, it just, it, you'll never get the same type of marketing ever again in your life, and it's a missed opportunity if you don't do that. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think for me, I didn't really think about it as marketing. I thought about it more as dialogue and that I always just wanted to be a part of that dialogue. I wanted to get my work, my art out there and have other people see it and interact with it. And it was really old school because there wasn't the internet back then, actually. So it had to be books, these things at the, at the bookstore. Um, so it was a matter of, for me, entering things, sending things out, just kind of putting it out there so that it started to... Um, bring things back to me. And it really worked. You know, it, it would, I would get people contacting me from other sides of the world, even back then, that would pick up a book and see some work and something that spoke to them. So it was really exciting to start building that kind of community and not really putting the pressure on it of, like, I really have to sell this right now. I'm just in, you know, setting the groundwork. 
at that point. And to weigh in on that too, I think both of them, their work, they created a lot of content in order to kind of build their audience and get the word out. You know, an apartment therapy is all content and that's kind of how they, you know, built their foundation. And I think you guys have the ability now to publish a blog, to share something on Instagram and to be creating content every single day. And so understanding who your customer is and where they're hanging out and what kind of content they want from you is really the first step. And um, I think that people get stuck on like, how do I start with social media? Or how do I start putting content out there? And really, you just have to do it. And it's scary. And you'll every time you hit publish, you'll think, maybe I'm saying something stupid and all my followers will hate me. But like, you have to get really comfortable putting your story out there, sharing the things um, that inspire you, sharing the work that you're doing. And people will notice that and they'll organically start following you and the people who love your work and want to support you will come out and do that. So I think, you know, just being willing to put a little bit out there and, you know, take a leap on yourself can be a really powerful way to get that initial traction. And as you guys are all talking through um, building community and being able to connect, I feel there's so many ways that you can do that. So when you started, you know, what social media outlet did you work on? Where did you find your community and find that like target audience? So when you say reach your customer, how did you find them and reach them? Yeah, I think for that, you know, I, I think a lot of times there's this pressure to have to do all these different things. Like I have to do Twitter, or I have to do Facebook. For me, it was about doing that stuff and having a presence out there, but then just letting the thing the one that made the most sense with how I am naturally and it felt the most comfortable, so it ended up becoming the most authentic, so that was Pinterest because I'm a collector and hoarder, but I'm also a minimalist, so it's like a weird contradiction. <laughs> so Pinterest is perfect because I can collect all this stuff, but I don't actually have to have it. Um, and, uh, yeah, and I also had on my website even a collection of words, which sounds really strange, but I actually kind of just write down words that stand out to me sometimes just an everyday conversation and have a list of them and I had that on my website and someone at Pinterest saw that on my website and was intrigued by it because it was that same mentality of collecting and, and putting it out and publishing it for people to see. So uh, they ended up doing an interview of me and then they put some of my boards on their main page and so then I got all these followers. So Pinterest for me blew up and you know, I had a couple hundred thousand followers and not because I really wanted that or I really tried, just because I did what I felt like I wanted to do and what was important to me. And it turns out there were other people out there that, it, that related to it and were interested in it. So They like gravitated towards it because yeah. that's what you were. Yeah, because it was authentic, it was genuine, it was just yeah. me being me and not trying to force something I'm supposed to do, kind of. And Jess, one of the things that we did, um, and I, I started off kind of skeptical about this, but I became a real believer by the end of it. But, there's a lot of really great science out there to help you understand your customers and your market too. And, and one of the things that we came to the business feeling like we understood who our general market was, but, um, but in the digital world, I mean, there's all kinds of resources that you can access and it's at surprisingly um, uh, economical price points to get out there and survey the marketplace, apply some science to that part of it. And, and I became a real believer in it because I came away from those meetings thinking, okay, that was a, you know, that was a really informative session about who our customers are, where we can go to meet them, um, where to spend our resources. Um, and I can tell you, when we got started, a lot of that really um, played true, you know, so. That's great. Where did you go? Um, you know, SurveyMonkey, I'll put a little, um, uh, you know, um, uh, plug in for them, but I mean, it's a fantastic tool. You can, you can get a lot of great information. Um, there's all kinds of services out there to sort of distill that for you into actionable items. And, and I, th I think we really benefited from that a lot. That's great. That's wonderful. Very helpful. And I think in my career, I've worked for a lot of different brands. Um, and I don't think I've ever worked for one that people are as passionate about as they are about Moo. And we do have beautiful products that look and feel beautiful, but I don't think that's what makes people love us. I, th I think what makes people love us is that we are able to, to bring their personal business to life, and, and when they get that first business card, it's, it's, the, it's the physical um, representation of, of their business, and they're very excited and very proud to share that um, with everyone and, and to share it with us. People love love showing us their, their cards. I have one from Kurt right here. Um, as soon as people hear that I work for Moo, they, they, they want to show me their cards. And I think it's, it's, 
it's, it's because it's a beautiful product, but it's also because what it means to people. Does, does anyone here use Moo? Yay, Moo. <laughs> um, so I think for us, we have this built-in community of people who are willing to talk about us. And so we, um, we focus that and, and we tell people, please post um, using the hashtag Moo cards. And so every week we get dozens of people posting about these products and, and this, this thing that they're just so proud of. And so then we can use all these beautiful images that people, real people, are posting in our, in our marketing. And so we've actually found that um, the images from, from customers work better on Instagram than, than the things that my creative team build in studio. So we've started using a lot of those real beautiful images that people are, just feel so passionate about in, in our marketing. And we're really, you know, I think giving community, um, giving people a place to, to rally around your brand and, and kind of corralling them around that one thing, um, it, it helps because it, it really just, um, you know, builds momentum from there. And um, from what I've seen too, working with different makers, I think um, Instagram right now is probably the most powerful um, social media tool for a lot of makers and artists because it's so visual and you can share behind the scenes pics and pictures of you know your finished products and you can really put it out there. But I know in the beginning it's very intimidating for people because you put stuff out there and then it's like crickets, like no one's talking to you and you're like, you know, does everyone hate my stuff? But um, I think that if you, what I did when I first started out, out there was think like, what do people want to hear from us? And so we're a community that helps creatives grow their business. And so people want to learn about other creative businesses and they want tips. And so every day we feature a different maker on our Instagram account. And so we tag them and we're like, you know, check them out. And that has grown a big following because people want to see who the other makers are. People want to have their stuff featured. People are commenting. So think about, you know, what is it that my brand represents? What's the story I'm telling? What does my customer want to hear from me? And start creating content on Instagram that focuses on that. And people will come and you will build your following, but it takes time and it takes consistency. And so it's really easy for people to start on a social media platform and then like do it for a day and quit. But it's like, if you just continue to do it over and over again, I promise you will have a following and you will grow an audience and it just, it happens to everybody. So um, I think consistency and really, you know, thinking strategically about what you're sharing um, will make all the difference. Great, awesome. So when we're thinking of like value props, so we have a lot of sellers here. When you start a business, um, where do you go to find you know, what makes you different and what makes you stand out and where do you get that inspiration? Yeah, I think for me, one thing was, uh, and this goes way back to even um, being in college and, and being in a fine art program but also specializing in graphic design and having them, you know, people telling you what it is. So you're a graphic designer. Like, so I always thought, well, I don't really understand what that means. You know, it's like graphics too specific, designers really broad. It kind of means nothing to me. Does it mean anything to people that I'm gonna try to explain what I do to? And I kind of thought it didn't. So um, after years of working and kind of looking at everybody else and what they were doing and thinking that I had to fit into certain definitions of who I was and what I was gonna provide, I finally was able to sit down and write a paragraph, a sort of manifesto that was like who I am and what I feel like I want to bring to people and what's important to me that I think will be important to other people. I don't know necessarily, but I feel like if I put it out there, I put it down on paper, that there's going to be people that are going to get it and are going to relate to it. So I changed all the words. You know, I, I wrote it differently. I thought, you know, I'm, I'm not... Since graphic designer doesn't really feel like it relates to me, I thought, you know what does photographers do? Photographers are individuals, people hire them, they hire their personal style. Um, you know, fashion designers make sense to me too, because they put their name on stuff and you're buying that person and their beliefs along with their, their product. Um, and even doctors and lawyers kind of made sense to me because I liked how it was called a practice. And I thought, you know, I'm never gonna stop learning. I'm always gonna keep evolving. This is a practice, you know, so then, I came up with uh, you know, the name Funnel, the fine commercial art practice of Eric Cass because I wanted my name attached to it. I wanted it to be a practice. I wanted it to be kind of fine art. Um, I wanted it to be conceptual with the idea of a funnel, which is the process that I do, which is 
an artistic process or a designer process of taking everything in, distilling it down to its essence. So there was like all this stuff happening in this giant name. And it was also funny because it, when, when it did get published in books and stuff, it gave other designers a real headache because it's like a sentence instead of just a normal short name. So it kind of uh, makes people frustrated, which is funny to me. But, um, uh, but there was a real point to it. And there was a point to every single word. And then, and then not only that, when I would talk to people, when they would contact me, I didn't call them customers, I called them patrons. And I didn't say projects, I said commissions. So I started just using this language that had more to do with the fine art world and some historical references of when you know, uh, people with money would commission artists to, to, do, to do things, and they, they were patrons. It, just, it made it all ro more romantic, too, I think. But it also was somewhat more understandable, I think, to the general public than some of the terminology that that other people were using. But it, at the very least, it set me apart, made me different, and I thought it was really intriguing that people totally bought into it. They were like, oh, hey, I'm interested in a commission. No one ever said that before. I, I started saying that, you know, <laughs> they, would, they would just say a project or something. So um, I think it's really cool how if you, you can really define things the way you want to define them. You don't have to feel like you have to fit into somebody else's kind of a thing, um, so. Well, um, in developing the notion around our um, value proposition, I have to admit to, to kind of co-opting a little bit of that from companies like Melissa's at Moo. You know, when I would go online and see that there were, um, you know, really different approaches to what were really old line, very well-developed business models out there like commercial printing, uh, and I certainly was involved in one. The corrugated packaging world is, you know, very well established and been around for a long time particularly the analog version of it that I worked in previously. And I thought to myself, you know, isn't it so cool that, that these new companies are based on, on the internet and they're giving you a chance to create your own, you know, um, versions of the products that they, that they make. Why aren't we able to do this with packaging? Why, you know, why aren't we willing to do this with packaging? We had the tools. I mean, the tools were available to us. It's just nobody was doing it. So I had spent 30 years saying no <laughs> to the marketplace that I now want to serve, you know, and, and, and the reason that we're able to do that is because of this digital, you know, revolution in the technology. And that, that really is both on the printing side of it where we're creating the finished product for our customers, but also in terms of the way we're communicating with them. You know, in, the, in my old analog world, you know, of uh, corrugated packaging, I had to drive across town and meet with somebody face to face and there was a lot of overhead involved in that and, um, you know, all of the things that go along with it. And it's what, it's what made those minimum order quantities as big as they were because you had to have enough, you know, of a transaction to cover all that cost. And so I just love the, the fact that this new value proposition is we're going to relate to you in a way that, that allows you to be a bit DIY in the creation of the product. We're going to print it digitally and eliminate all these big overheads. And, um, and so right from the beginning, it really felt like we understood the value proposition. Now, what remains to be seen is if we're answering a question that people are actually asking. And, uh, and you know, the early evidence is that we are, but you know, that's, uh, um, for us, um, uh, a clear vision of the value proposition was there right, right from the beginning, even though we kind of borrowed it. Maybe, I guess. <laughs> no, no. I think for us, our value proposition is um, kind of in between what you would get from a, a local printer and, yeah. and an online printer. So we enable you to do the things that you might go to a local printer to do, and you can customize things, and you can get beautiful things like gold foil and spot UV, but, but you can do it in small batch. And so you don't have to spend a ton of money yeah. like you would might have to do at a local printer to get those types of features. So I think... Um, between that, I mean, there's a lot of different places you can go as a small business to, to fulfill that need. Um, but I think, you know, our, our, that is our value proposition. And then we couple it with, um, with our brand promise. And going back to, it's, it's so important um, that you, especially in a marketplace like Etsy, where there's probably at least one other, maybe a couple other people who do the same thing, that you differentiate yourself 
and figure out what your um, unique selling proposition is and, and write yourself a brand manifesto that really isn't uh, for, for customers, it's really for you and for any employees you have. And, and try to ask yourself if everything that you do, are you sticking to that brand manifesto? And then from there, you spin it off into a brand voice and a tone and make sure that every communication you have on your website and your emails and your social sticks to that brand voice and tone. And for us, we saw um, what the competition was doing in the marketplace, and we wanted to be a little bit different and be and and really, you know, I, it's it's hard to say that anybody else in in our space would have the um, the consumer excitement that that we have with our customers. Um, and I think it's because we built a very playful brand. So our tone, everything we do is very playful. Um, it's meant to be professional and smart, but fun, but not in a snarky way. Um, we're, we're actually a British company, so there is a lot of, a lot of our stuff might seem a little, <laughs> a little British snarky, but, but we try to walk that line between being playful and, and being sarcastic, but having a lot of fun with our brand and um, with, with, a brand, with a product that really isn't fun, it, it's business cards, um, but we have a lot of fun with it, and I think that, that for us, that's part of our unique selling proposition, um, and, and everybody just needs to figure that out for themselves, and you really need to take the time to put on paper what your, what your brand promise is and write that manifesto. And something that I see is a lot of creatives, especially like artists or people who make something handmade, in the beginning it can be really hard to see what makes your product unique. You know, there are you know, thousands of people selling candles and paintings and everything on the internet and you're not solving, you know, a, a huge, like a world changing problem. So it's hard to see like clearly what you bring that's unique. And so um, when people come to me and ask about that, the first thing I ask them is, who's buying your products? Like, are they parents? Uh, how much money do they make? Where do they work? How did you find them? Why do they buy the products? And what you'll find is like, people only spend money on stuff they like, they want, you know? And so if you can figure out what, why they want the product that you have, that is your unique selling proposition. So what is it that, they, that you're offering your customers that they can't find somewhere else? And it doesn't mean that the solution isn't available anywhere else. It means that you're offering it in a way that makes them want to buy. And so figure out why they're buying and, and who it is and then, you know, how you grow that. Like, that's your core of, like, who you're going to reach. And so start there and kind of where you are and then, you know, you will grow, you will get more understanding of kind of where you should go with your brand from there. Perfect. Yeah. Um, so one last question and then we'll open it up um, for the audience to ask. Um, so I guess if you could give the sellers, this audience, um, like one tip or one like learning, what would that be um, for them to start or they could be throughout their um, kind of like selling cycle from a brand perspective, what would that be? I think, I think what you do every day in terms of pleasing customers has more to do with establishing your brand than anything else that you can accomplish. If you're not, if you don't, make products that delight the people you're trying to serve, then everything else is going to be really uphill. Um, and, and we really um, try to refocus on that all the time. Every order that comes in, um, it's amazing the conversations that we get involved in about, you know, has the, uh, what's the customer's intent here? What are they really trying to accomplish? Um, can we put ourselves in their, their shoes and, and make sure that our product does for them everything that they intended, and hopefully more. Uh, and we know if we get that right, that all the rest of it, we'll stumble occasionally and get some things wrong. But if you get that piece right, we feel like you always get to live another day and, and keep working. But it's pleasing, I think, pleasing customers is first. I think about pleasing yourself, too, first. Like, that sounds weird, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> took a weird turn. Um, uh, listening to your heart is what I meant to say. Uh, and your gut, and uh, anything else you want to. But um, yeah, I think, it, I think that's really crucial because I think now it's exciting because you, know, you can reach the whole world really easy and really inexpensively, and you can find other like-minded people. So I think knowing yourself, knowing what you're about, believing in yourself, um, and if you are really passionate about it, there's a good chance there's a lot of other people that are really passionate about it. 
Um, and I feel like that's one thing, that's why a lot of people come to me, because they see that. They see that I'm really excited about it. And, you know, I run a business. It's about money. I got to keep things going, keep things growing. It's always about that. But if you can do it from the point of, of just passion and excitement and, and energy at the same time, it's, it's really awesome. It's fun, you know, and exciting. So I think that's, I think it's okay. And sometimes I think people get a little caught up on the other part of it of, you know, all the business stuff and maybe let the passion stuff kind of go. And I think it can be both. It's just a balance kind of a, kind of a thing. And my um, advice would be to stop trying to do so many things. So most people that I talk to, they're on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and they're selling on Etsy and they're doing wholesale and they're building their website and they're doing all of these things. And we all have the same number of hours in a day and you don't have enough time to do all of those things really well. So pick one social media platform and do it really, really well. Pick one channel for sales and get it as big as you can and then add another channel because if you try to do everything at once, you will do it all really poorly. And if you invest time into really figuring out one piece of your business, you will learn so much more and ha be able to grow that so much farther than you would if you kind of diluted your time over multiple um, ways of marketing. Should I jump in? Yeah, you jump in. <laughs> all right, I got, I got three tips. Um, one is going back to the beginning, I think, uh, being, being a little crazy about what you do. I mean, I don't know what you all do, but I assume you do it because you're, you're driven by uh, your own, no one asked you to do it, probably. Um, so if you can harness that and, and, and be a little bit crazy in the space, if anyone's buying anything you make, first, first of all, that's a good sign of success. But to differentiate yourself, um, if you are the person who's more crazy about coffee grinders than anyone else, or crazy about coffee in general, and so that's everything, and it comes through your your page and your in your in your messaging or your you know your emails or whatever. That that is that's really important because there's a lot of static in the world. There's a lot of people who want to do stuff, and um, but being a New Yorker, you want to find the person who knows it more than you do, and you trust crazy people to know it more than you do, I think. Um, and I'll say what goes along with that is, if you are the person who knows, uh, this is, there's a company that makes the best coat hanger, and I don't know why, I mean, when, <laughs> but if you are that person, someone's going to come along and write about you. They're gonna, the media is going to pick you up, and that will be your best marketing, again, going back to the beginning. I was written about a couple times in the beginning, and, and it sort of vaulted apartment therapy into uh, prominence, and you don't get that again later on. Um, my second tip is, there's a book called Growing a Business by Paul Hawken that I read um, before I started, and it is a, just a tremendously inspirational book about not only why to start a business, but how businesses can be so good. Um, business has taken a lot of um, hard knocks in our com country in the last uh, decade, but I'm still a big believer that businesses are um, and you're all in business, are the places that they are fast, flexible, honest. If they, they have to be honest to succeed. They can be dishonest, but they won't succeed for very long. Honest and creative. And I think uh, cr creativity and uh, imagination really lives in the business community. So I'd read, read Growing a Business. And the last thing I would say is um, you brought up watch your customers, please your customers. We're in a really interesting place at Department Therapy. You can ask your customers what they like and what they think, and they'll tell you. But probably most of the time, they're wrong. <laughs> they're, they're, they want to tell you what they want to tell you. It's That's much right. better to ask, watch them, watch what they do. And so what we're doing now a lot more is, is, is seeing what do they buy, what do they click on, where do they actually go? Because they'll say one thing and they'll often do another. We all do that, it's natural. Um, and to, just to round that off, there's a, um, a great, great designer, uh, um, a woman who, a name will come to me in a second, and she was, um, she's older and she has been a big inspiration. And she, with her first products, she would go to the store she sold at the MoMA store. That's where she broke through when it got out into retail. before Etsy. And she used to stand near her product in the, in the MoMA store and just watch people come up to it. She'd sort of stalk her own <laughs> <laughs> product. And I'll never forget that. I think that's a good uh, metaphor for what you do, watch what, what your customers do. Not I mean, what they say is super important too, but watch what they do because it's, that's, that's brutal honesty. 
Okay, I'll go last. So I think um, we're, we're here to listen to a panel about entrepreneurs and marketing. I'm not an entrepreneur, but I am a marketer. And so I agree with all of the things that everyone else said, but um, what I will add is in marketing, the most important thing that you can do is know who your target is and know everything about them. Um, because the things that you, the, the places you go, the things you read, the things you say may not be the same thing and the same places that your target audience goes to. So, so before you spend any time or money doing any sort of marketing, you really need to understand who is buying your product, who you want to buy your product, who's buying it today, who do you want to buy it tomorrow. Um, and so that, that's you know, kind of what we do. We started, um, our business makes very natural sense to um, find people like yourselves, very creative professionals, people who appreciate design and are willing to pay more for it. Um, unfortunately, after a couple of years, we're gonna get pretty saturated in that market. So if we wanna keep growing our business, we have to think about who else can we market to? Who else might be able to use our product? And, and we, we need to talk to them differently. They're not going to appreciate the same things and, and think the same things and go to the same places online as our original um, customer base. So after our creative target, we really um, go after uh, tech startups and realtors and, and yoga instructors and people that, that you know, we've, we've kind of solidified our base and now we're, we're trying to grow beyond that. So, so we think about, you know, what, what sorts of places do they go? Um, what sorts of things do they read? And, and I think um, as a marketing team, uh, we're, we're all pretty connected into social media and so one of the first channels that we tried to, uh, that we were very active on was Twitter. And we would post a ton every day on Twitter. Um, and we really just weren't getting very much reaction out of that. And it was because that's just not where our audience was. Our audience was on, uh, int um, on Instagram and Pinterest and, and Facebook. And so we really kind of had to, to switch our approach um, when we think about the marketing channels that we want to that we want to spend the most time and, and, and effort. And of course we, we do that with Twitter, but right at, at this point we, we kind of identify, you know, which, which channel do we use for which message? And, and maybe Twitter's for customer service while we use um, Instagram for inspiration and we use um, Pinterest to celebrate customers. So we really identify for each marketing channel, um, you know, what is the purpose of that marketing channel? and what is the objective that we want to get out of it, and then we determine how much time and money we're going to spend on each channel um, because of that. So, so that's, my, that's my two cents. Wonderful. <laughs> Great. Well, are there some questions out there? Hi, my name is Alyssa, and my husband Matt and I own Simply Palettes. My question is for all of you, or just one of you. Um, Basically, we've been going with the mindset that we stand out because of our story. And the benefit is we've had a lot of experiences in growing our business over the last couple of years. We also got to travel the world and we built a tiny house and we've been trying to share all of that as part of our brand. What I wanna know is, is there a place for that within our brand or being so unfocused, is that causing us to lose a target audience and therefore lose a conversion to sales. What do you make? So. Um, we make art, furniture, and home decor out of reclaimed wood. Okay. How does, it, how does all of that story tie into what you, do, what you make? Well, I think part of the story for us is more so just what this business has created, both in our products, but also for our lives. Um, I don't know if that really makes sense. I mean, because of how we're living, it allows us to run this business. So for us, a lot of it ties in together, but I don't know if that's coming through in our brand or if it's just making it really confusing for people. Okay, I, I, I'll throw it out to them, but it, your story is important as long as it's about the product that you're selling. So they're not buying, they're not, you're not renting your tiny house to them. <laughs> so, as long as you, I mean, you, you don't have to tell your, reader, your customers everything, right? You don't, you don't, it wouldn't be helpful to you or them. So the things you tell them you want to be tied to, why are, they, why, why are they buying the thing that you make? And why is the story that you're telling them make what you make more interesting? 
to them or more valuable or um, teach them new ways to use it or to understand the materials. So if you stay, I would just stay focused on that. Um, that's just the starting point. But I, I do think it's legitimate to believe that there are some people and, and markets that respond to the actual story of the maker of the product as much or more than they do to the product itself. You know, there's some things that I own that I promise you I own them because I appreciate the person who made them so much. And um, it's the, uh, the object is actually kind of just the collection, right? It's not necessarily, um, you know, something that I bought because of utility or, uh, you know, the value point or, you know, any of that. It's because of the story. So I, I think there's some legitimacy to what you're saying, you know, as well. I wouldn't give up on that totally. Yeah, I think every situation is different, obviously, but, you know, that, the one thing that I, I think about now, because, again, this idea how you can reach everybody, reach the whole world. So, like, for me, as a, a designer who does branding, there's tons of other ones out there that do it, too, and do it really well. And you, everybody has access to all of us because on an equal kind of footing. So I, I start to think about, well, what, what does separate me out? Why would you work with me instead of that person? And for me, a lot of it is that story. It's my philosophy. It's my process. It's my experience. It's, it's a relationship. You know, and so I like to tell a lot of that backstory of where my inspiration comes from, who I am as a person and an individual, because I feel like that's the only thing that I truly have that nobody else has. You know, there's only one me. I do something similar to what other people do, but, you know, if you want to work with me, there's only one me. So, but, you know, to your point, it, it's related. It all comes back to, to what I do, and it work, it's with the industries that I work with. And it shows my love and interest in the things that I'm actually branding and working on. So, and it's kind of behind the scenes. It's just intriguing. I mean, it's that thing of like that kind of human connection beyond, again, the business side and the marketing side and all of that. I mean, it, it still needs to be crafted. The story needs to be crafted. It needs to be told in a certain way. But I do think it's a really good way to connect emotionally with people. Um, yeah. Hi, my name is Tony. I own Piccolo Pianta and I make plant terrariums. So, Customer service is very important to me, and a lot of times my customers will become friends with me to the point that they'll email me and contact me all the time. And I'm wondering, is there like a way to keep it more professional? And is that bad to build up these close relationships with these people that become more friends to me? Like, I don't know, like, because all of my customers end up, I become close with them, and I don't know if that's hurting me or if that's something that I should try to keep I at a certain I don't know, level? <laughs> I would say it's always great to be friends with your customers because they will buy more from you, they will recommend you more. Um, I would say draw boundaries to respect your time. So I know when people think they can email me anytime, it's like they're emailing me questions about everything. And so drawing boundaries of like, hey, I'd love to help you with this, but you know, I, I'm really busy right now. Or you know, if it gets to where it's taking up so much time because you're emailing them all the time, that's a problem, and you just, I think, drawing boundaries of like, I'm really busy, this is a big, busy season, or, you know, kind of trying to answer questions quickly, I think would be good. So finding that balance of, you know, making them feel like you care about them and respect them, but not taking your, away your whole day, like responding to emails to customers. Professionalism is important. Um, you, you are, I'm going to talk a little later today, and I think what's so important these days is that you are, and we're talking about story, we're, and, and there is connection to people's lifestyles and their stories, and they're obviously connecting to yours, but you do want to keep them focused on that. Um, if your story becomes so powerful that they're more interested in talking to you than buying a terrarium, then you may be off. You might be a television show and not a terrarium maker. Uh, might be the Kardashians. You do nothing. And you do <laughs> But, but I think to her point, I think keep, keep, if someone's emailing you three years later about a product that they bought, that's amazing. And you just, just uh, keep, you say, well, why haven't you bought a new one? You, know, you, <laughs> you, need, you just have to come up with new products, new reasons for them to update. I have a friend who's a, an artist, and I think this happens more to people who are really in the craft, but when it's artistic and handmade, you're going to get it more often. Yeah. That's a lifelong connection. And, and her challenge is how she sells these uh, brass pears that are beautiful. And... Once you have a pair, you don't really need another one, but they start <laughs> collecting them. So she's created new, new things, new ways of reaching out, because people do collect. And, and, and maybe you want to, if you have that loyalty, you should um, push, push into it. And when you're talking to them or emailing, say, say, hey, do you know I've got something new? 
Check it out.